A Glance in the Mirror Chapter 28 Newlyweds The owners of the flat were an odd lot. Whatever they did in the evenings, they made a lot of noise about it. There was an enormous amount of banging and crashing, with shouts and screams, which reverberated from one side of the house to the other. This was Sally and Terry's nightly entertainment, which didn't make their love-making any more accomplished than the honeymoon. In fact, put Sally right off. At one time the husband threw a chair that bounced from one wall to, in the kitchen to the other. Their rooms were sparsely furnished, and the kitchen positively barren. The bed creaked, and the floors echoed. Sally was homesick and went home to Priory Gardens, and that didn't go down at all well with Rita and Harry, who were just beginning to get quite used to the idea of a peaceful existence. It was all quite hopeless, and no way to carry on. And this lasted about a month before father-in-law decided that Terry and Sally had to have a better situation that might prove to be more encouraging. They searched the local newspapers and made numerous phone calls. Eventually a first floor unfurnished flat, number 8 Meadow Road, Pinner, became vacant. A Lloyds Bank employee had occupied it, which came to the attention of Harry, who pounced on the chance to obtain it. He contacted the agent and placed a deposit. After we had given permission to proceed, now they could use all the things they had both collected to furnish their new home. They moved in on May the 20, uh, 27th in uh, 1957, after its total redecoration had been completed. <coughs> they furnished the flat with a kitchen table with two chairs, a double divan bed, light green carpet square, two Cintiq armchairs, a G-planned wardrobe and chest of drawers, and all the other bits and pieces needed to make up an ongoing home. With all these and an orange box covered with a tablecloth to support the black and white TV, they were now all set to start their married life. As a starting out presence, my in-laws had kindly bought us a magnificent Mason's tea service made in the Strathmore design. This became our pride and joy. Terry's motorcycle was kept down the side passage to wheel out every day to set off for Neasden. It wasn't long before he wanted a larger machine. He discussed this with Trevor, a work college, who advised buying a bike similar to his own, a green metallic BSA 500cc twin called a shooting star. With that advice he looked round the various showrooms and eventually found one at Slocum's in Neeston. What a difference it made! Sarri continued to work at Wembley Hospital as a, as a secretary and cycled there every day, come wet or shine. Her push bike w with the wicker basket on the front, often with the day's shopping inside, had to negotiate Harrow Hill. She used the hill as a challenge to get to the top without stopping to push. The house was shared with the Turners who lived on the ground floor. Mrs Turner and her daughter did housework for local people and her husband worked for the council. Living with a family below was a strain, particularly when Sally repeatedly cleared her throat at night. The result would, uh, would be a tremendous banging on the ceiling below with a broom handle and frosty glances during the day. Mrs. Turner was always a few centimetres away from the drawn net curtains that twitched every time the door opened. It wasn't long after being married that Chroma Works shut down their artist uh, studio. The management gave three months' no warning, saying that they could retain only half the staff to be lithographic calorie touchers, and offered to these, those who had been with the firm the longest, the three left, would have to leave. The union set them, sent them white cards for three vacancies at Wood Rosler and Wilkes in Over Acton. Everyone was satisfied. Fred, Trevor and Terry, George, joined George Clements, who was holding the fort for Wood Rosler and Wilkes. The first job was to complete a job for Watney, Watney's Ales. It was unfortunate that the printing industry didn't pick up particularly for hand-drawn poster production. Soon the work dried up altogether, and the three moved on to paste-up artworks for Park Ward Pharmaceuticals. Trevor soon left then Fred, both going to Watford and the gravure, gravure industry. 
leaving Terry to continue patching up artworks until he was offered a re retraining job as a photo litho retoucher wood within Wood Rosler, which he most gratefully accepted. Fortunately, the firm kept Terry's wages at the same level, which, considering his newly married status, was very welcome, and it didn't take long before Terry fitted in with the other men, what they were doing and how. His previous skills stood him in good stead, and Campbell Gilbert was detailed off as his instructor. He was an adept tutor, interested in the job, and open-minded about new technical methods. There was an enormous amount of handwork still to do on both the continuous tone negatives and screened positives. Because so much time was devoted to masking out the negatives, Terry had simple, ample time to take in what was going on around him, adapting quickly to the new working environment and new range of skills he had to acquire. Sally and Terry continued to live in Pinna throughout this year of retraining, and within six months a vacancy was advertised for a calorie toucher at Sun Litho in Ryslip. Terry applied with a white card, not saying that he had just been retrained. The work was far more advanced using the latest techniques. However, the position offered an, more money and he accepted. At least five other workers from Wood Rosler from different departments went to Sun Litho. It was a relatively new plate makers and provers who were taking advantage of the boom in Litho. They used the latest Kodak tricolor masking system, which ensured less handwork. Retouchers were expected to page plan their own work ready to pass on to the sheet planners. Two Roland flatbed machines of the latest design proved the work for customer approval. Throughout this period, the trades union held legal power to influence the growth of the industry. It was not just happening in, print, in printing, but occurred in all major industries. The obvious restrictive practices stifled productivity, put off firms seeking greater profits and investing in new machines. Unions were always trying to improve the conditions of their members because this was their main task. It was done on a day-to-day -day basis and not sufficiently long-term to di direct efficient control. The pressure on the economy increased. Managements didn't stand a chance to resist all that political power against them. In the following years, when Labour was in office, there was a marked increase in the growth of public sector employment. This spiral of wage claims, strikes and inflation, re relying on restricted, uh, restraint to curb an ever-increasing enactment of the position, was destined to fail, which it did. To maintain, perhaps increase the standard of living, <coughs> Terry had to find employers who used the latest technology, and this meant he had to move firms every two or three years. It was no good staying at the same place out of sentimentality, because wages just wouldn't keep pace with the cost of living. Most plate-making firms paid precisely the same rate to all employees, believing that there would be no industrial friction between the skills if they were all paid the same rate. This wasn't to be so, for it created stagnation. Paying workers the same rate was neither economical nor in the best interests of the production, however much it's pandered to social engineering and the rights of workers. And that meant that you couldn't seek to arise for the greater productivity that you made, because that would mean the others would feel threatened. It would show that greater productivity could be made by admitting that this one man was better at his job than another. Who was going to be the judge? If a wage rage ra rise given, then that man should have all the most difficult work. Workers agreed amongst themselves to accept the same rate to ensure total, total transparency. Some workers allowed this for altruistic reasons, others because they wished to toady up to the agitators. Managements were happy to go along with this to have a quiet life. It was obvious who was a capable and efficient worker. Under this scheme, the common denominator was the lowest, least efficient worker, setting the norm. This was patent no nonsense. Even if the standard of final work was the same, which never happened, quality and quantity gradually declined.
However, new methods and machines came into the production fa line faster than workers could adapt. Reasonable working arrangements were not able to keep up. And once the management proved how efficient, adaptable and easy to operate the new scanners were, then the power of the unions and trained operatives was over. Now, non-union, untrained in printing variables could operate the new electronic machines using a set of manufacturers measuring figures. In 1961, life expectancy for males was 70 and females 74. The rate for employment growth in Britain was 3.2, the lowest for the seven largest Western economies in the world. The place of women was particularly diff difficult. The war years had seen a tremendous influx of women into not only the armed services, but into industry. There would be no turning back. Women sought parity with men in all fields. Women's jobs in printing factories at this time served mostly in the warehouse box making or in the machine shop feeding paper into the large presses. Apprenticeships and trainee positions for girls only started in the early 80s. Girls just out of school no longer thought about getting married and having children. It was now about getting a job, fulfilling ambitions and becoming independent. The economy was thrusting ahead, which continued for over a year. Working conditions negotiated on an annual basis. In retrospect, always the same. Longer holidays, shorter working week and an annual increase to keep abreast of inflation. Overtime worked by the majority, at least two nights for four hours, four and a half hours per night, and Saturday mornings from six to twelve. New firms were opening up every week, offering better wages and conditions, and there was a steady turnaround of staff. The industrial unrest centred on shipbuilding, dockside workers, mines, and motor works. This had the effect of turning young people off those jobs for fear of being involved and losing wages. The long-term result was a lack of suitably trained workers within these heavy industries. The emergence of a web offset, printing presses, from continuous reels of paper for the production of local newspapers and periodicals cut costs, introduced better quality pictures and allowed the use of colour for both newspapers and their supplements.